Thank you. The power of dreams. Um, when I was six years old, I had no idea that there was some, so much power in dreams. But I do remember one of my loftiest dreams, thanks to this picture. Because um, I've been watch to the theater and been watching the documentary about the Kontiki expedition with my father, Thor Heyerdahl's Kontiki expedition. And um, then you maybe can understand what, what kind of fleet this, uh, oh sorry, this is uh, in front of me. Uh, that's my little Kontiki fleet. And I think I, uh, I saw the documentary about six years later when I uh, was in school, and I couldn't understand that was the same movie I had been seeing. Because in that picture, uh, I remember what was going on in my uh, head at that time. And I think I was mixing the, the, the Kontiki uh, film with uh, some different uh, songs for kids. Because I remember um, I was, my plan was to sail uh, crossing all big oceans to meet kids with different colors. And that's not anything about the Kontiki expedition. And I was also very concerned what I was going to bring as uh, for food. And, and that was all the candy I was not able to get when I was a kid. It was a lot of chocolate and different sort of uh, salty uh, uh, candy. And so I was really preparing that in my mind. That dream didn't last very long. We went to Denmark on a holiday and I got seasick and I'd never ever was dreaming about, you know, crossing big oceans anymore. But I, I grew up in the skirts of Oslo and my parents are altar persons. Uh, they, uh, I remember I got a lot of stories, not fairy tales, but stories about the old explorers like Nansen, like Amundsen, like uh, Heyerdahl. And um, I remember that when I was eight and a half years old, I read a book about uh, the Salt Pole expedition uh, to, to Roald Amundsen. And I have, since I got my first pair of skis, I had loved skiing and still love skiing, as yeah, I guess you understand. And that, uh, and I didn't know that was uh, something strange being a girl dreaming about the Salt Pole before I was 12 years old. And thinking back, I was a very naive 12-year-old uh, girl. We went, yeah, I was on the, uh, uh, to Germany with my school brass band, and there were eight girls sitting in a room exchanging dreams. And all my friends, they were dreaming about a handsome husband, big house, and a fancy car. Sort of in that number, I think. And uh, I was thinking, I remember, how boring to dream about something that would come automatically to you when you grow up, I was thinking. Uh, I learned my lesson now, but, uh, um, but uh, when it was my turn to tell about my dream, I said, well, my dream is to ski to the South Pole. And I still remember their reaction. Was I stupid? That was impossible. That was a boy's dream. And uh, I was thinking, wow, it must be something very wrong with me. And, uh, but in one or another way, I kept that dream. I kept a room in my heart for that dream. But it took years before I articulated that dream again. Actually, it was, I think it was about 30 years. And here I am on my way to the South Pole. It should be a video here, I think, yeah. And some music, that would be nice. Um, and think about, there should be some music, please. <laughs> um, no. No, they won't let it. Uh, but think about, um, think about uh, your dream when I'm skiing here. What makes your heart beat a little bit faster? What makes the blood run a bit faster in your veins? That's important for you. Maybe not your partner, maybe not your friends, maybe not your parents, maybe not your boss, but chase that feeling. That's really, that's really important. I thought, uh, I've been crossing the Greenland ice cap and I was on my way to the South Pole. I've been crossing all the mountain plateaus in Norway. And I thought I was, had, you know, knew what was to expect. 
But when after a week I came into an area with huge sestrugis or snow drifts, and I was starting to get irritated. I started to, I was sort of in my dream trip, and now I was irritated. And, and after three days in that area, I sweared and was swearing at my sled, at the snow drift. And that's telling you, because you have may have experienced something uh, similar. To, get, uh, to spend a lot of energy of being irritated of something you can't do anything about. It might be a person or a decision. And I was laying in my sled, and I was, I was not, not in my sled, in my sleeping bag. And uh, I was feeling at, really tired, not the good, you know, the tiredness like you, you feel when you have been working hard for 10 hours a day, but being irritated. And I was, saying, I was just laying, laying there thinking, I said to myself, Liv, you can't go here swearing and tearing for 50, 60 days. You would be exhausted when you reach the South Pole. And then I was thinking, okay, from tomorrow, you have to imagine, imagine that you are skiing in a gallery of modern arts. And that changed my expedition totally. I saw pictures in the snow, in the skies, and my mind went all over and the energy came back. I reached the South Pole Christmas Eve 1994. And I think that's the best Christmas present I will ever get. I skied for 50 days. Uh, that was the year before the satellite phone was in common use. And I brought a shortwave radio, but due to different things, I didn't get it to work. So I didn't talk to anybody for 50 days. No, I think that that a privilege to have been experienced that not talking to anybody for 50 years, because I think I charged my batteries for the for the rest of my life with that experience. Because today, you you know, you are connected. You, we don't have to be connected, but very often we are. And uh, that's also a good way to find, if you don't know, you know what your heart is really beating for, and you don't you know, find a redirection, spend time in the nature. That's your best friend, that's your best companion. Uh, I thought, I'm not sure if you can see on this picture, that I have a lot of energy. I thought I would be exhausted when I, uh, when I reached the pole, but I have so much energy. At that time, I was a high school teacher. And the last three years, not three, uh, three weeks uh, coming into the pole, I was thinking, I have to share this, this experience with my students. And I started to write a management book for kids in, in the back of my log. And coming home, I, I spent some time with my students, and suddenly the, the, the student that couldn't, you know, was not happy writing, uh, they, you know, they was to, 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 to think about their dream, think about all the possibilities they had in, 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 in front of them, they got creative. And I remember uh, the following summer, I got a postcard from a 17-year-old uh, boy, and he said, Liv, thank you for showing me that I don't have to become a lawyer like my dad. And then I was thinking, That's, this is important, you know, to, 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 uh, to, ha to let st students, young people, kids dream, and that dreams are important. Um, I just sort of gave up that management book for kids because I, I learned that young people or youth that need that kind of help don't read books like that. But um, wonder, I over all wonders, only I think a half a year later I had given up the book. I got a letter from an American woman called Anne Bancroft. She asked if I wanted to join her on expedition crossing in the Antarctic continent and use that as a kind of a tool or marketing tool to, to create a curriculum that uh, could show how young people could fulfill their dreams. And um, we had a quite, quite uh, lofty plan. We wanted to cross the Antarctic continent, 3,000 kilometers. The summer in Antarctica is short, 100 days. Uh, so we needed help from, from Mother Nature. We also put up four uh, goals or obstacles. We wanted to become the first women that crossed the Antarctic continent, wanted to create the biggest uh, curriculum uh, or educational program on internet. We wanted to, be, to remain friends on the other side, and we wanted to have fun. The two last become very important for expedition because 
as most expeditions, things do not go as planned. We need also help from Mother Nature to be able to cross the continent, 3,000 kilometers in 100 days, and with a sled of 130 kilos behind, need, we, needed, we needed help. And we, it was a lot of fun training when you have a, a lofty project. The, the ski sailing is the fun part, but pulling car, car tires is a sort of the boring part. Uh, for me, it's training in the outskirts of Oslo, where, where I often meet people in the weekends. It's sort of a, I think you have to be kind of a brave to, to do that kind of training. But it's good, it, it, well, it's important to train what you really need uh, when you are on an expedition. Uh, you see, a strong back and strong ties. We uh, were delayed for two weeks in uh, Cape Town, um, so we had a time pressure from the very beginning. We were also communicating, and it seems to be easy to communicate when you have so much time. We skied 10 hours a day, and to, but to, to sort of structure your thoughts, structure the message, and connect it with the educational program is really hard. So we felt that we had sort of a, a holiday the day it was, I felt it was kind of a holiday the day I had, had uh, I didn't have to make the report. So that was sort of a, sort of a strange feeling. We felt that we, that would be easy, but it's really, it's really hard. We were sailing because we were uh, delayed, we'd be sailing 10 hours, 14 hours, 16 hours, just to catch up. And uh, the biggest problem on that is that we actually fall asleep on the skis. And we tried all the methods to keep, keep awake and uh, all the songs you sung, but you know, you can't only the first lines and then it's la 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 and then you fall asleep again. We reached the South Pole uh, um, uh, in January uh, 17th. We, uh, we had put a deadline that if it reached the South Pole uh, later than January 16th, we would abandon the crossing. So we were just in time. Uh, for the for the for the for the crossing, so we continued, and um, this is the this is a great day. I can see the Transantarctic Mountains on the other side. It's a beautiful area, and I just have this picture to just to show that we remain friends on the other side, and we had a lot of fun. And when a project sort of is coming closer to the end, you start to think about new projects. We learned on this expedition that three million kids in 116 countries had connected with us. We also learned uh, half, an hour, half a year after this picture was taken, we called CNN twice a week, that we got 2.1 billion media hits. And then we think we have to continue to, to use uh, expedition as a kind of marketing tool, a sensation to promote uh, positive messages. Um, we also had, you know, what you, is, is it something to learn about uh, expedition? We, I, we actually had two attempts to ski to the, to the North Pole. We did not make that. One from Siberia, working for two years, getting sponsors, creating curriculum. After 20, 20 days, we were just picked up by Russians. It was a controversy about, you know, tourism. And we were back again. Two years later, we, come, we worked together with the, uh, the International Polar Year. Uh, our, our equipment, some of our equipment were, were smashed by a plane that come, came out of control. Uh, and that, again, uh, caused some injuries that we had to back out. Four years with planning uh, North Pole expedition. Lots of money, lots of time. So I think the biggest learning is of the, the, the um, not the failures, but the sort of when you hit the wall. And then I think uh, both Anne and I are good to think about what did we actually achieve, rather than that think what went wrong, what, to, to, to dig into that. And to talk about that and to enjoy actually what we achieved. Uh, the next project we want to reach, or I think that's the um, or most loftiest goal. Our goal is to reach 50 million, not penguins, but youth. And we call it Access Water. And uh, if you see in the bottom of this uh, slide, we, we want to reach 50 million youth. And if we can uh, sort of erase the awareness of the freshwater issue, 
and get 50% of these 50 million engaged and then create a movement of 25%, we think it's just a success. And we want to follow this, um, this uh, access water project on each continent the fall every other year. So ne next project is to follow the Ganji from the Himalaya and out in the Bengal Bay. And then we can bring young students and from different co continents. So, um, so that's, uh, and the method is very simple because Action is the key. We just can't sit and learn and learn, but we need the, the, the kids and the young people to get out and see what's the, what's the issue here and to think what to do uh, and, and, and create an action. And they can be journalists, they can take videos, they can, yeah, there's a lot of things like that they, they can do. And the hardest, <laughs> and the, it's been really hard to find a team. There's hundreds of women that really want to ski to the South Pole as a sports expedition. But it's hard to find, you know, we have been working a long time to find uh, women that really want to contribute to make the, the world a better place or to be. Because it's to, to, to work and to, to be able to communicate uh, being on an extreme expedition. We want, need to co cooperate for 70 days. There are women in different ages, different religion, different uh, experience. So symbolically, we have to cooperate to, to reach the South Pole as we all have to cooperate to, 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 to solve the freshwater issue. And symbolically, we ski on the world's biggest freshwater issue. Here we are training in, in, uh, in Finse, uh, in Norway, last winter. And I have a video uh, at the end, so I'll let you meet some of the, uh, the team that will start in November 15, uh, 15th next year. I think this is bigger than I ever imagined. Our goal, I think, would be to bring awareness and to, to show people that we need to make a difference and we need to impact and motivate each other, to have an impact on each other's lives, to, to really bring about change in the world. Nothing is impossible. Uh, the limitation is only in mind. Once you make up your mind, you can do anything. I think the strength in the group is the values that we all share and the passion that we have. Um, some more so for the physical side than others, but um, I think at a, at a really fundamental level, we, we believe in people and we believe in, in the human spirit and being able to achieve things and change people's attitude. That is the strength. We'll tell other women also, this is also possible to develop that can-do spirit. And I think that we'll make a very big impact, hopefully, in the world and in raising awareness on the challenges we face, especially as women. Change the attitude, to change the vision, to change the consciousness. And when you are going the right direction, and you do one step at a time, then you will be there, that's for sure. Thank you, and you can follow us on um, yourexpedition.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.